our next speaker is our next speaker is Sasindu Rijaratne from the University of Southern California, Department of Electrical Engineering. And he's gonna be speaking about a programmable FPGA-based memory controller. So. Sorry about this, QuickTime is causing problems. I have multiple QuickTimes open. There, there we go. Hi everyone. My name is Sasindu Vijayaratna, and in today's talk, I'm going to talk about my research work on programmable FPGA-based memory controller. And this work is conducted by University of Southern California. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. And without further ado, let's move on to the details. Looking at the generational improvement in DRAM technologies in past few decades, we can clearly see that even though the capacity of these technologies have improved around 130x, the bandwidth is only improved by 20x. And making things worse, the latency of these DRAM technologies has only improved by 30%. When we compare how the computing power of CPUs have improved over the years with the total memory access time, we can see that there is a huge gap between them. And this scenario is called as a memory wall. And this is the same for the FPGAs and the DRAM technologies as well. And to overcome these things, computer architecture community has proposed some multi-level cache systems or multi-level buffering systems and internal memory uh, storage uh, methods. There are some limitations to the memory accesses in certain aspects as well. So one of the aspects is the external memory technology itself. So give you some idea about this, let's consider the basic building block of a DRAM module, which is called a bank. So when a read request reach uh, a bank, the typical scenario is this uh, bank search the address of the incoming request uh, in the row buffer. If the data in the row buffer uh, is from the same address, it will directly send this data to the uh, FPGA. So this phenomenon is called as the row buffer hit. And if the data is not in the row buffer, then the uh, bank will call the corresponding DRAM cell rows and load this data into the row buffer and then send it back to the FPGA. So this is called a row buffer miss. So the time spent on a row buffer hit and the row buffer miss is uh, different because in a row buffer miss, uh, uh, a bank has to spend more time on this particular operation. So uh, getting these random accesses to the bank again and again can decrease the performance of the DRAM. And if we getting a sequence sequential accesses and these uh, these accesses are already in the row buffer then we are getting row buffer hits uh, again and again and again which improves the total memory access time and also let's consider a sequence of request which has read and write one after the other 
And uh, in this scenario, when reads and writes are one after the other again and again and again, uh, there is a certain uh, transition time from reads to write in the external memory. And if we get the same set of requests, but all the re read requests accumulate together and read, uh, all the read requests come first and then the write request, then uh, we can see that the total time, even though the number of uh, accesses are the same, total time is low. So there are these kind of limitations in the external memory. FPGAs also have some limitations when it comes to the memory accesses. One of the examples is the underutilization of effective memory bandwidth. For example, let's consider a TDR4 external memory which connected to a FPGA. Typically, the data width between the mem uh, FPGA and DDR4 external memory is 64 and the burst length uh, of DDR4 is 8. So typically F between FPGA and the DDR4 external memory, uh, we communicate 512 bits per request and this is a constant number. But the data structures used in FPGA accelerator can be different than 512 bit. Typically it's not less than 512 bit and it's around 64 bit. So if the memory access, if, if the FPGA accelerator access the these 64 bit data structures one by one, then out of 512 bits, we only useful data is that particular 64 bit. So most of the data that coming from the external memory is going to be a waste. So when, when uh, we're considering these accesses from external memory, we need to consider about this uh, physical uh, constraint in this FPGS as well. So we found that if we increase this usability of these uh, memory accesses, we can improve the total uh, memory communication time by at least 5x. In the preliminary stage, of our research, we looked at several convolutional neural networks, graph convolutional neural net accelerators, and graph accelerators that developed by our research group. And one thing we found in common is there are two types of memory access patterns, and we can name the name them as element-wise transfers and bulk transfers. So in element-wise transfers, what, uh, what these uh, accesses are focusing on is a single unit of data. And their target is to load or store them in minimum latency. And we also found that this uh, single unit of data shows a spatial and temporal locality. But this request may not become one after the other. There will be one request and after some time, it will explore their consecutive other accesses. And also the other type of the memory accesses are bulk transfers. So what they are focusing on is they try to support a streaming kind of uh, memory accesses. So the load or store operations are focusing on loading a set of memory locations in minimum time and they show very high spatial locality. So the motivation for our project is uh, the main thing is we are trying to provide a common template for a memory controller which can be plug and play uh, by the accelerator developers and uh, we hope that it will reduce the total develop development time of these custom accelerators and uh, one of the other objective is to make it lightweight because uh, we need the accelerator developers to use most of the FPGA resources on the accelerator and use our lightweight model to improve their memory access time. 
the memory controller that we are proposing can be configured during the synthesis time and we need set of parameters in order to configure our memory controller so we, uh, a user can feed this information as metadata to our platform so uh, the complete set of metadata and these required configurable parameters are included in the paper and these uh, metadata can be categorized into three uh, uh, three subcategories and uh, they are uh, the accelerator model based metadata fpga platform based metadata and memory configuration and when we receive this information uh, to our platform we develop a functional specification of the accelerator and hard, uh, hardware parameters to our uh, memory controller and feed it to our rtl model and this rtl uh, template will generate the memory controller instance and then a user can use it as a ip core and integrate into their accelerators and uh, this particular slide shows the overall architecture of our design as you can see the, uh, we have a unified memory control architecture internally it has two main sub modules called cache engine and dma engine uh, we will uh, look more into these uh, modules later and it also has a scheduler which uh, reorders the requests and then feed it to the memory interface ip our memory controller has a configurable interfaces and one of these interfaces is from accelerator and a memory controller and the other one is between the memory controller and memory interface ip and we keep these interfaces scalable depending on the metadata we receive we decide the width data bits of these input outputs uh, in these interfaces and also we do data packetization when we receive data from the acceleration accelerators and the ma main purpose of it is uh, keeping these uh, uh, memory uh, these interfaces in internal modules unified and scalable so we when a we receive a set of data we do a packetization and we generate a, a set of fleets and then forward into the modules it improves the communication efficiency and it reduces the latency overheads as well and our memory controller also follows a weak memory consistency model and uh, these are weak cons uh, the memory consistency model that we follow is sufficient enough for the memory accelerators so the main concept is uh, to maintain the same order that we receive from accelerator side to the memory if these requests are to the same address and the uh, accesses are to the different locations that can be changed inside the memory controller so in summary we uh, are you, it concluded into a weak memory consistency model and uh, we uh, we take measures to maintain this weak, weak consistency model inside the cache engine dma engine and also between the cache engine and the dma engine and uh, it will also maintain within the scheduling policies as well let's look at the inside of the cache engine so the target of this cache engine is to satisfy a single element accesses efficiently so as i discussed earlier in this fpg accelerators this single element accesses has spatial and temporal locality so therefore using a cache makes sense in this scenario 
And in our actual implementation, we are using two parallel pipelines, which are called PE pipeline and MIM pipeline. So what the PE pipeline uh, does is it takes all the requests that are coming from the accelerator side. And if they are, it is a read request, it will check whether the data is also available in the uh, cache. And if it does, it will send back the data to the accelerator. If not, it will pass us this data to the uh, memory side of our memory controller. And what memory pipeline does is, when we receive data from the memory side, which means if there is a cache miss or a write request uh, that came before this, uh, uh, before that, and then the data for that corresponding request reaches the cache, the memory pipeline will update the internal cache uh, memory uh, using the memory pipeline. And in order to maintain the consistency, once we receive data from the memory side, we will stall the PE pipeline and then activate the memory pipeline and update the internal cache and uh, progress along. And our DMA engine is consists of multiple uh, data buffers. So uh, it, it, it can uh, handle more than one DMA request. And we also uh, thinking about the consistency model and whatever, whatever the request we receive first will be satisfied first. So we keep track of the order of the, uh, the DMA accesses we received to the DMA engine. And uh, these DMA engines uh, support, as I mentioned, streaming, a uh, stream of bulk transfers, so multiple read or write requests uh, to uh, consecutive memory locations are satisfied in, the, in this DMA engine. The next important module that we are targeting is the scheduler. So the use of the scheduler is to explore the raw conflicts and raw buffer hits in the external memory. So the target is to increase the raw buffer hits while avoiding the raw conflicts and reduce the total amount of time I spend on memory accessing. So when the requests come to the scheduler, first we perform a batching. So what happens in batching is uh, within the input buffers of the scheduler, we accumulate set of uh, data requests that uh, came into the memory scheduler, and then we forward it to a Pythonic sorting network. So the target of the Pythonic uh, sorting network is to reorder these requests, and the requests that are going into the same uh, uh, row uh, are stack to, uh, together and they can be the consecutive they can be resorted into consecutive memory addresses in that way we can increase the total number of row buffer hits and after the bytonic uh, network uh, sorry network we do a serialization and forward it into output buffer so we use a Pythonic sorting network because uh, with Pythonic sorting network, we can increase the parallelism inside the FPGA. And also we do not wait till the input buffer to be filled. So we have request timeouts because uh, have, uh, waiting for input buffer to be filled can lead into a deadlocks. So let's look at into our results. So we implement our design on the Silinx Alveo U50 board using Verlock HDL. And uh, we focus on uh, graph accelerators that build for uh, GCN acceleration and CNN acceleration. 
and we use a commercial memory interface IP which is directly connected to these accelerators as the baseline. So let's look into the resource utilization and in this section I am focusing on each module and their resource utilization and, uh, and I'm going to break it down to you like that. So uh, when it comes to the DMA engine, the resource utilization changes with the number of parallel uh, DMAs that we are using inside the DMA engine and the size of the DMA buffer. So when the number of parallel DMAs that are using inside increases, we can see that uh, the lookup tables, flip-flops and internal memories like URAM increases linearly as the parallel DMA increases. So in this particular figure, you might see, see it as exponential just because I have uh, drawn it, drawn the x-axis in uh, the log scale. Uh, but originally uh, what happens is as the number of parallel DMS increases, resource utilization also increases linearly. And when we increase the uh, DMA buffer size, what we observe is the internal memory usage increases linearly. And when we look into the cache engine, uh, as shown in this table, we change the cache line width, degree of set associativity of the cache, and number of cache line. Uh, and observe how this uh, resource changes. What we uh, observe is total uh, memory used by the cache linearly increase as we increase the cache line width or degree of set associativity or number of cache lines while keeping all the other parameters constant. And then we look into the scheduler and its uh, performance and its utilization. So when we increase the batch size, we were able to find that the resource utilization is also increasing linearly. And when it comes to its performance, so to this particular experiment, what we did was we uh, get we create a synthetic uh, memory request that is targeting on the one bank and uh, we ordered them randomly and feed into our memory scheduler. And what we observe is, uh, as the, the batch size increases uh, from uh, up until six, uh, batch size being 64, uh, the total num uh, time decreases and then it uh, gradually increased. So our observation was, as we uh, increase the batch size, the reordering time decreases, but the batch formation time increases. So after batch size exceeds 64, there was a considerable amount of time that is spent on batch formation. That's why after 64, it started increasing. So the optimal batch size uh, we found was like keeping it 64 bit, 64 elements, and we we received uh, we were able to get the minimum number of uh, 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 FPG, uh, memory access time. And now let's look at the performance analysis. So for that, this as I discussed before, we use CNN workloads and GCN workloads. And the type of workloads we did and type of networks we used and type of data we used can be, uh, you can find it in the complete experiment <coughs> in our paper. So here I will show you this summary. So uh, when we use our memory controller with CNN workloads, we observe that uh, the total memory access time is decreased by 58%. And uh, as you can see, most of the time is spent on the DMA memory transfers, while the cache line transfers is uh, very low. So uh, the reason is uh, that uh, there were 
like 80 to 85 percent cash hit rates and since there are more cash hits uh, the number of time the cash engine was used is reduced and when it comes to the gcn workloads we also found around 25 percent of uh, of uh, memory access time is reduced due to our memory controller so in conclusion we propose a programmable memory controller to use with custom FPG accelerators. And uh, our propo proposed memory system is has mem <coughs> modular hardware and it is reconfigurable and lightweight. So in overall access, when we consider the overall memory access time, we observed that we were able to uh, reduce the total ac memory access time by 58% on CNN and JCN workload compared with the commercial memory controllers. So this is the end of our presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Any question? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Sindhu. That was really, really interesting. Um, I am not seeing a question on any. Oh, wait. Here we go. We have a question on Slack. Perfect timing. Um, Sissy Yuan asks uh, Besides saving of average access time, um, is the variation of latency bound changed also? Yes, actually, there is a change in latency as well. Like, uh, for example, uh, we are using uh, intermediate cache system between uh, the external memory. So uh, when an access like uh, trying to access like the external memory, there is a certain uh, amount of time that normally typically it's spent, but having an intermediate caching system, we, we were able to improve it uh, for some time around uh, eight x to, uh, to three x around that area. So uh, it actually depends on uh, which uh, like uh, so, in our implementation, we have a DMA and a, a cache. So, if we were able to use a cache system, and it, uh, the access is going through the cache, and if it's a cache hit, we were able to uh, improve the latency as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm not entirely sure that we'll end up answering. Uh, her question as she's changing some of the uh, emphasis on various terms. Um, uh, however, uh, because of time constraints, I'm going to ask you to, to respond further to that question on, um, on Slack. Yeah. Um, um, I'm being asked to, we're trying to get a little bit back on schedule. So um, I wanted to thank you again. That was a really interesting talk. And I have a couple of questions I'll probably post in Slack as well. Okay, sure. Although they're a bit more naive. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Noah.